Welcome to I Am Nala podcast, brought to you by Nala Feminist Collective or Nala Fem, where we discuss changes needed towards the liberation of African women and girls. Nala Fem is a Pan African front of feminist leaders with a mission to foster, embolden, and mobilize women and girls from Africa and the diaspora for transformative feminist change. I am ASHB, founder of Nala Femme, and on this first season of I Am Nala podcast, we talk to policymakers and activists to ask what should be done at COP27 taking place in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt, in a few weeks. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome back to I Am Nala podcast. Uh, today, my guest comes from Egypt. On 28th of July, she was appointed as the official president envoy on youth for COP27. Omnia al Omrani. Welcome, Omnia, and congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be uh, with you today for I'm Nala. I'm really amazed by the work that uh, Nala does, and I'm so happy to be uh, with you here today. Thank you for joining us. And I really want us to take this opportunity for young activists to know more about your role. So what does an envoy on youth for COP27, it's a first of its kind, what does it mean? Yes, so um, this year the presidency team decided that um, that over the years young people always get the opportunity to attend COP and to speak at different sessions as well as participate and connect. But we have been advocating for many years for our engagement to be more meaningful and to be part of not just attendance but the agenda setting, especially of how negotiations, uh, the events are created. So that's why the COP27 presidency decided that our presence not just is about participation, but it's about setting up the agenda of COP. And this is where I come in. Um, so my mandate is to engage with young advocates as well as youth-led organizations in the setting of COP, especially through the thematic days, which is organized by the COP27 presidency. We have around 10 days and each day is focused on a specific theme. So this is also part of what I do is to integrate young people and not just youth focused events, such as the Youth, the Young and Future Generations Day, which is going to be on the 10th of November, but also to mainstream youth speakers across all the different thematic days from adaptation to mitigation to gender as well as science and so on. And the second part of what I do is to really build the capacity of young people to be able to participate meaningfully and have strategic and effective goals out of their participation at COP, be it the blue zone or the green zone, as well as really empower young people to speak in a way that is intergenerational. So we're planning to have intergenerational dialogues between young climate advocates and solution makers and policy makers from ministers to heads of delegation, as well as negotiators. So so take us through it. Uh, for a young climate activist who, it's their first time to be at COP, right? And it's a two weeks long, it's thousands of people joining and they might be overwhelmed. How do you think they should uh, make the best of their time? What's actually the process? What are the key days, the key moments, the key um, color zones that you mentioned? Can you explain us a little bit the process? Yes, of course. So uh, I really love when someone asked me this question because around four years ago, back in 2019, I was the first time, it was the first time for me to attend the COP. Uh, it was in Poland. And I remember I was so overwhelmed by how, you know, each hour at COP, there are so many things happening. But it's it's about what, what I was lucky to have is, first of all, an induction by my organization. And this is what we're already planning is to have a simple toolkit for young people to understand the very basic tools to be able to attend and prioritize what they where they can be. So COP is divided into two zones. The first zone is the blue zone, which is the zone where all the negotiations happen, either open or closed. And it has to be accredited uh, organizations and participants with a specific badge to be able to attend the blue zone. The blue zone, there are negotiations open and closed, and there are also side events. And then in the green zone, this is more open to civil society organizations. It does not need a specific batch to attend, but it's a, a space for all the different entities, uh, organizations, as well as um, innovators and startups to demonstrate their efforts and climate solutions. 
And there are also diversity of sessions, ideas, cafe, networking, and so on. And then for the thematic days, this is a day that is organized by the COP27 presidency. We have our own sessions, but it's also an invitation to all the different UN agencies and organizations and uh, countries, uh, because there are also uh, the blue zone, different pavilions. So this is a space for a country or an organization like the WHO or UNICEF or the British Council or civil society to demonstrate their work and, and have daily events and sessions throughout COP. Um, so the thematic day is an invitation to all these different entities to focus their events or their work on a specific theme. If it's adaptation, there is mitigation, there is youth, there is also gender and different uh, themes that are also published on the, on the COP27 presidency Twitter as well as website. So how can also young people make the most out of their participation? I think the, the, the most important step is to do your research. And we, were, we are going to provide you with all the different uh, tools and introductions to what is COP and what are the different meanings of what the negotiations are, what are the different governing bodies, uh, what are the terminologies that are being used, the abbreviations, because it's very complex. But once you understand them, it just gets easy. The next important step after you do your research about the Paris Agreement, about where we are right now and what is the aim of this COP, like why, what are, what is COP27 going to discuss? And I highly recommend a website called the Climate Tracker. It has all the different updates throughout COPs and throughout the years. And then what is the agenda points COP27 is looking at? The next step is to have your own calendar. We are going to create a calendar for young people with youth events, but it's important for you to have your own calendar uh, of the two weeks. What are you planning to attend? What are the negotiations tracks that you're planning to follow? What are the side events that would be very interesting for you to attend? And who are the partner organizations who are going to be there so that once you finish this event, you can approach them and they can help you with your advocacy and help you with your work. So uh, planning ahead, and then what really helped me is attending COI, which is the Conference of Youth that happens one day before COP. And it is a conference made for young people to build their capacity to understand how they can participate at COP. And at the same time, it's an opportunity for them to deliver their inputs in a global youth statement, which is a declaration that will be presented directly to the COP27 presidency, as well as used by young uh, advocates at COP itself with our demands representing young people from all countries. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. So you, you are expecting between 25,000 to 30,000 people to be there in Sharm el-Sheikh. What's the quota of this, uh, if there is any, that will be young? And also, you know, it's different from being at the negotiation table than just attending events or speaking. So is there also a quota particularly for that? I know that, uh, you know, a uh, government delegation usually is the one that can bring that and we can encourage young people to to come with the government delegation, but also maybe for those, it's their first time and they're trying to understand how COP function. Can you explain that process where you're just there, you're participating, your civil society, you're pushing, you're advocating through your message, but also there is the negotiation where decisions are actually made. Uh, yes, um, that was actually a discussion I was having yesterday with my team, is that how can young people be part of the negotiations? Because you can be part of the negotiations through two different ways. Either one, you can be part of the country that has the vote and has the voice and has the power to influence negotiations. Because at COP, there are parties who are the ones who are negotiating and then there are the non-parties or the observers which is in that case where all the youth-led organizations all the different civil society organizations are part of so one way that young people can be part of the negotiations is to be part of their national country delegations and this is a, an agenda point that we are planning to push for for this COP and the next one and future COPs in general is to how to integrate not just young negotiators but also young delegates to be part of their country delegations. This is already starting to be there with several countries in Africa and Brazil as well as in Europe and Sweden, Netherlands. 
Um, and then in Africa, I know there's in Kenya, Nigeria, there's in Tunis, and there's in Morocco, uh, where they have invited young delegates to be part of their country delegations. And we want to do that you know, to have the same conversation, as you have seen how, for example, the gender conversation at COP has been very vocal and we want to do the same with youth, that we need to ask the question, are young people there? Are young people part of the delegation? Is there a young person speaking at the negotiation room or not? So this is a question that we have to ask. We are asking, but not yet strong enough. And COP27 is an opportunity to do that, especially for young people from Africa who will now get the opportunity to, opportunity to be part of COP more than uh, previous years. And then the second way by which young people can still be part of the negotiating process is to be able to lobby uh, with their advocacy, with the global youth statement, and find different countries who, who are allies to uh, the meaningful youth participation agenda and the youth engagement agenda. So if we are not at the table, we can also lobby with the countries that will be there. And there are many countries that are supportive, but they need the means of how to integrate youth at the climate agenda. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the gender aspect because you know young women are part of both the youth movement and the women movement and they're part of the gender agenda and the youth agenda. And sometimes it's, it's a blessing and it's great because we have a leg in both, but also it's a challenge because sometimes young women then are forgotten and there is not a specific engagement for them. So uh, I know this is also big on your agenda. How, how do you plan to do that? How do you plan to make sure that especially young African women are at the table of negotiation? They are increasing in number and in influence in this COP. That's also very important to tackle because, you know, gender has been, the gender advocacy has been very exemplary at COP specifically because they've been very loud, they've been very persistent. And that is why now at COP, we always ask the question, is this panel, is this negotiation room, is this delegation uh, equal in gender representation or not? Can we see the same number of women or not or not? If we don't see it, then we start being not accepting it and trying to change it. And I believe that as young people, when we are doing our own events, and for example, when I'm doing my own work, being very conscious about how young women are going to be involved and ensuring that if I'm, if we are organizing a panel, for example, we have to make sure that we have young women participating in that panel, demonstrating their work. And this is what we'll, we'll have the opportunity to do, is to hold different platforms for young people in general to demonstrate their work and their efforts and to be able to speak. And I and my team will make sure that whenever there is this panel, whenever there is this, these are their, these presentation or platforms, we have young women engaged and able to uh, share their efforts, share their work, but also share their voices in a way that is meaningful and equal in representation with other young participants. Um, and we also have coming up a, a youth pavilion planned. So once there's also a pavilion for young people, it will be an opportunity for young women to demonstrate their efforts, to participate in sessions, to hold their own sessions and their own dialogues and be able to moderate and guide the voices of young people towards having uh, women-led voices at front. Yeah, uh, th that that would be great. Uh, actually, the youth pavilion, so for the first time, happens at COP. So that's also uh, uh, a great Hopefully. milestone. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> Uh, so I have a couple of questions for you that come from young people themselves, young activists who have been from one cop to the other, uh, you know, and they have they know the challenges and they're anticipating what's going to happen in Egypt. So the first one is there is always this main um, three main challenges of visa accreditation and funding. How does Asia plan to tackle these three, especially for young activists, young African activists? Because, you know, we always struggle with the visa, but this is our African COP. So we're, you know, hoping more that uh, visa won't be an issue, but also accreditation and funding. How are you advocating for that? Yes. So in terms of visa um, and uh, and accommodation as well, uh, the COP27 presidency are working, they are very much prioritizing the process. I think for the visa, it's actually, you know, it's good that it's in Egypt because the visa processes are definitely much more easier than it was 
in the previous COPs with Glasgow, Madrid, and so on. Um, but also the presidency are working very closely with the embassies to facilitate the process of getting visa for COP. And normally, once you register, you always have a support letter with you uh, to be able to apply for visa. And it actually expedites the process. But also the presidency team is putting more effort in facilitating visa as well as for accommodation it's it's at the website uh, you can check and they and the website really facilitates the process of booking your accommodation ahead of cop and i highly recommend that the earliest the better and this is the case with every cop and i previously had experiences with accommodation when it's always last minute because for me when i was heading my delegation of students we always came from all these different continents and we need to find the same accommodation so we always try to have it as earliest ahead so that it's also much more affordable and convenient but what's really good about Sharm el Sheikh as a city is that it's so it's, it's a it's a city that is made for conferences so all the different accommodation and the hotels around the conference itself it's going to be very easy to move from one hotel to another and there will be a facilitated transport transportation it's not it's good that it's not like a capital city where it's super difficult to be able to access the conference venue and go back to your hotel it's a it's a city that is by the sea and open for the conference itself with all the hotels and all the transportation tailored for participants and to facilitate uh, they're moving from one uh, from their accommodation to the cop venue itself. So in, in regards to, you know, finding around if they find an hotel that's not so close, it's still OK because there will be transportation available to take you from there to the cop venue. In terms of accreditation, um, so this is more a process facilitated by the UN FCCC itself. And um, the registration for for getting accreditation was in July, the end of July. But on the other hand, there are young the youth constituency are opening many calls for young participants to attend. Um, it's also the challenge of getting funding, but sometimes some cops have, for example, scholarships before, but some also have badges available, which is the biggest challenge. So we're always sharing all these opportunities at the, there's an African uh, youth uh, WhatsApp group that we have, and it's really a pool of uh, sharing opportunities, organizations share their last minute badges for young people to still uh, get the opportunity to attend. That's brilliant. And in terms of uh, the funding, does COP itself provide funding or young people should go and fundraise from other organizations? The idea is, is that COP is divided into different constituencies. So it's it's always very challenging because all the different constituencies we always want to support them, but with funding, it's it's very challenging. But I, I've seen many opportunities come up, for example, with Climate Tracker, Yongo as well, but Yongo is a youth constituency, so it's, it, they will not be able to provide funding for attendance, but they would be able to provide badges for attendance. But I know that throughout, you know, the months that always leads up to COP, I see many opportunities coming up from different organizations to fund youth participants. But it's always the, you know, the importance of being updated with all these different opportunities. Absolutely. And maybe we can encourage many donors and partners and funders to, you know, make space for funding young uh, African activists in within their budget. Also, Within their delegation, a lot of international organizations have the opportunity to have their staff and a large delegation go to COP. So I think part of their commitment to engage young African activists is to provide that seat or spot or space uh, for them. The other call from young activists around COP, especially in Egypt, is saying that Egypt is the largest oil producer in Africa. Egypt has not set a target for reducing net zero emission. You know, a lot of criticism around the hosts itself from young activists, climate activists, voices, especially Africans, because I think as much as this is our African COP, this is a great opportunity for us also to show leadership uh, as African countries. So will, will that change? What would you, you know, say to young activists who want to engage in that conversation, will that change? Will there be commitments, uh, exemplary commitments from Egypt that are different from previous COPs? 
Yes, um, that's a great question because I know that uh, for Egypt, we have just updated our nationally determined contributions, our NDCs, uh, where we have scaled up our commitments and ambition. And this COP is, is not just about commitments, it's about implementation, because countries have already uh, submitted their NDCs and their plans. But the biggest question that we should ask as young people, are you implementing your plans or not? And how are you implementing them? And is your implementation, um, have, ha, does it have young people engaged or part of the implementation process? Because it's not just our role as young people to advocate for scaling up the ambition, because many countries can commit, but it's also about asking countries and working together with them in implementing these commitments. Um, and this also comes to a very important point is that you know, I also come from a very strong health and climate change background where at each COP we really call on countries that to scale up your ambition, not just for the environment or for the economy. It's also for the health of your community, the health of the children and the future generations that are going to be impacted most if commitments are not scaled up. But right now, our advocacy needs to be in line with what is happening, because we know that in 2020 and in COP26, countries were submitting their NDCs. And then in 2023, we will be asking the question of, are you on track? And we will be evaluating the progress. So right now in 2022, it's about implementation. So this is the question that young climate activists will have the opportunity to ask and will have the opportunity to be a key part of is how are countries going to implement uh, their commitments, and uh, and this is the same for Egypt and all countries, not just in Africa, but around the world. And the same questions that we get to ask our countries and we get to ask the hosts, we have to ask also countries that come from the developed agenda. Are they also committing and scaling up their ambition or not? Are they uh, committing to helping developing countries like the African countries in Egypt as well as they have committed to, because it's also important to not just see climate ambition, but to see climate justice and to think about building resilience and not just mitigating. Because what, what is also an opportunity uh, for us, this African COP is not just highlight mitigating and reducing carbon emissions. It's important to highlight building climate resilience and adapting to the climate impacts that are already accelerating. and. An, and African countries specifically, we need to uh, have the support from countries, developed countries from the global north, to be able to support our adaptation efforts because we are one of the most impacted by, by climate change. So it's not just our economies, it's also our livelihood, our food and water security that, that we need to adapt to more than just thinking about mitigation. The priority would be building resilience as well as resilience in a way that is neutral and in a way that is carbon free. Uh, so it's like, you know, doing two agendas at once, but it's important to emphasize adaptation and climate resilience, the scope itself. And the final question from young people to our envoy um, is also around, um, you know, young activists who are considering boycotting the, this COP altogether, you know, because of all sorts of reasons, uh, mainly also critiquing the host of human rights violations and, and so on. So for young African activists who are in that kind of debate and that kind of conversation. What's what's your message to them for coming or for you know um, explaining reasons for why not to boycott? Uh, what's your take on it? I, I'm I'm actually curious myself to to know because I've been encouraging a lot of activists to just occupy your space and be there and call out whatever advocacy you have. But what what's your take on that as the envoy, especially that you are the host uh, and Egypt has been continuously criticized for, for, for these uh, human rights violations. I understand how many young people and I myself get feel like things are not urgent enough, uh, negotiations are so long and it's so technical and we're not seeing the progress that we hope to see or, or we do not see climate change tackled with the same urgency. I think we also had the same questions with COVID, for example, that once COVID was in and countries started to act and this is the same and we want we saw that this can be done and it should be done for 
the climate crisis. But I also ask myself one question. So if I'm there at COP or if I'm not there, me not being there, is it going to... Because I see that COP gives you the opportunity not just to be able to call on countries to step up their commitment to act with urgency because it's not their future, it's our future as young people. We are going to be the most impacted and we need to be part of the decision uh, making table. But for us to be part of that and part of the negotiations, I see it as a process, a very long and sometimes frustrating one, but it, it's also an opportunity that we should not miss and we should not be there. And also at COP, I personally, with my organization, we had the opportunity to do several, you know, not just demonstrations, but a way that we, for example, during COP in Madrid, we did this 30 minute uh, stand at the venue itself, booked and everything, but we had all these small banners where we had all the different impacts of climate change on health, heat stroke, respiratory disease, asthma, mental health, depression, anxiety. And we had all these different banners where we held them and then we died on the ground to really show that climate change is impacting our health. And if we don't act now, it's going to affect us more than ever. And this, I, the message behind this is just to, and, and it was at the blue zone where all the negotiations were happening and negotiators were passing by in the morning to go to their rooms and start discussing. So it's kind of bringing, raising awareness to how urgent your discussions are and the, the small technicalities that you are figuring out, figuring it out. It's not just affecting you or your country. It's also affecting our health and the health of young people of your country. So sending in messages like that is important and it was important for us to drive several agendas, gender, health and youth. And the youth agenda has still a long way to go. So instead of not pushing it at COP, no matter how challenging and hard it is, and looking at the small wins, because each small win is going to drive a greater win, which is what we're seeing now with many different agendas at the conference itself. We're also seeing it, as I said, with the gender agenda and with different others like the food, as well as the water, as well as the renewable. The renewable agenda was not as it is now when COP started. So I think that the youth agenda deserves that commitment and that dedication. And for us as young people, we are known for being relentless and for being very persistent in our demands and in our future. So this should be the same for COP uh, instead of choosing not to be there. Yeah, I think there, there are diverse ways of activism. And, you know, we have a toolbox of different ways of doing activism and we need to choose the right one for the right occasion. So hopefully as young people also, we, you know, we continue these debates. They're very important how we organize ourselves in a united way, impactful way, and choose the tools we, we use to put pressure and, and to advance the agenda. At the end of the day, we all really want a future that is just and equitable. So my my final few questions for you is really around the Africa-Europe cooperation. And I know you mentioned in the, previously around also the commitments from European countries, the commitments from African countries. And I wanted to also know your your take on engaging, because you are the envoy for global youth on COP, uh, your, your take on how you're going to engage European youth and, and African youth in this. Not only, you know, global youth, because you will have diverse um, constituency there, but we have a continuous framework between Africa and Europe that we're trying to find a way of working together. It's not there yet, you know, and we have, especially on climate change, a lot of disagreements. Are you planning anything around that, around this uh, Africa-Europe partnership within the youth framework? Um, yes, so I was really lucky the, the past year uh, to be part of the first ever uh, youth sounding board that was created by the European Commission. Um, it has a, a group of around 15 young leaders that serve and um, provide insights to what the European Commission is doing, especially with partnerships. And we had the opportunity to uh, participate and to deliver recommendations for the AU, uh, for the African Union, um, the conference that was happening, as well as several partnerships that we were able to see from that perspective. And, I, and what was really uh, surprising for me as you mentioned, that climate change was not really on the agenda. It was not 
part of the plans yet. It was still very preliminary. And I think that gives me the opportunity now to explore how young leaders from uh, the African Union, from the European Commission, to be able to more to engage more in climate change because we were really building their capacity and asking them, like, you need to prioritize your work at climate change and your partnership, especially with the EU. Um, but I'm very open to explore how this can be activated within COP and if there's an opportunity to utilize this because at COP, many young people will be there from Africa and from Europe. And if we're able to organize a session together or a small consultation, that would be really good to see. Uh, but I would love to you know, connect with who would be there and how I can facilitate this process because in our plans, either ways to facilitate different dialogues and bring in young people and empower their work. And such partnerships are very valuable in empowering work led by African youth, as well as sharing of expertise, sharing of solutions. So I'd be very happy to facilitate uh, these kind of conversations at COP. And what would be your call to action for both European and African leaders, uh, especially at this COP? I know the youth agenda is your top agenda. I think my call to action was, would be implementation. It's so important and to also be transparent in the ways of how all the, 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 the you know, how each country in, in, in the European Union, the African Union has already submitted their national climate plans or their NDCs. And now is the time to learn how these NDCs are going to be implemented and with with the ambition that is needed, but also with a greater focus on adaptation. I think now more than ever, there are opportunity to focus on that uh, because throughout the previous COPs, it has been about mitigation and net zero carbon and carbon emissions, which is also very important, but it's important from a perspective that is not, you know, thinking about in the process climate justice is how uh, we are asking countries to commit, but we have to do it in a way that is just for each country. When we're thinking about transition or net zero carbon, we have to think about it in a way that is just, we have to, it's, it's you know, countries have to find ways to support one another and to really empower one another in when acting on climate change and then have young people support. Them. Absolutely. So Omnia, as a young woman, I know many people know you from, you know, both the health and the climate justice uh, fields, but also Many, maybe many more would know you now as as the envoy. But who is Omnia? And as a young woman, a lot of young women look up to you. They aspire to lead these portfolios. Uh, you know, as you lead them today, you know, w- what would you tell them, especially those in the climate space? What I would say is that when, when I started working on climate change, I always got asked. The two questions like you come from a health field how is this even related to what you do and then are you just uh, going there you know for all these conferences and all these events and I think what really made me so passionate and so in love with climate change and climate action is how empowering it is uh, because from it was empowering for me to learn from all these different expertise that were beyond my field but at the same time, we're all saying the same thing, that we we want to protect our planet and we want to protect our people. And this is not just about the environment, it's about protecting the health of our people, which depends on the health of the environment, which sustains us. So this beautiful relationship and then finding me as a young woman, having a role in it and having a very meaningful role, not just by you know, advocating and working with all these different organizations and policymakers, but also an area that I'm so passionate about is education, is how to bring in new knowledge to young uh, climate activists and young people to start caring and start understanding their role in the in the climate change conversation. And when you are working on climate change, it's not just because it's something that is extracurricular or it's something on the side. It's actually a responsibility that you have as a young person to protect and to advocate for the health of your environment. At the same time, by 
thinking of it at different scales. So as an individual, what can I do as Omnia, as a person, and how can I be uh, environment friendly and conscious about uh, what I what I do as a person? And then what I can do with my community and how can I build their resilience and their understanding and empower them to take actions on their own? And then how can I do on a global perspective by bringing in what I see from working with young people and what I see my community is doing and bringing these voices and these valuable perspectives and inspiring efforts to world leaders and to really be that lens and that guide to what they do um, on a global level. So I think, you know, it's, it's an opportunity for us to be loud and to be creative and to be there. Um, at, a, at an issue that is affecting us most, especially as women, it affects us disproportionately. And there's always, you know, the challenge of bringing in our voices, but it's not a challenge that we should in any way uh, be, you know, afraid of. Instead, we should be excited to, you know, tackle and to chatter down this brick wall one step at a time to be there at the table in a way that is meaningful, in a, in a way that is equitable, and in a way that really helps us bring young women like ourselves at the table. And we are 100% behind you as Nala Feminist Collective, and uh, we support you and we want to see young women like you leading the way. Omnia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your leadership on youth engagement for this COP, COP27. All the information that you mentioned, the links will be below. You will find it all of it on the, on the website. I hope everybody listening has been informed and inspired. You are listening to I Am Nala podcast and see you in the next episode.